Russia has not been able to achieve that is unclear to me. Uh, I don't draw conclusions of complicity at all, uh, but clearly they've been incompetent uh, and perhaps they've just simply been outmaneuvered by the Syrians. That is uh, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson who's going to have a busy week. He's going to meet with the Russians later in the week after a tumultuous couple of days. Karen Travers, ABC News correspondent at the White House. Good morning, Karen Travers. Good morning. This is already was going to be a very closely watched meeting, and now it's taking on so much more significance given how starkly opposed or opposite ends of the issue they are, uh, the U.S. and Russia, when it comes to Syria. I mean, that was a pretty strong statement from Rex Tillerson calling Russia incompetent last week, even saying possibly complicit in uh, Syria having chemical weapons. And you have uh, the Russians saying they're going to do everything they can to back Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian government and warning the U.S. against more military action. Karen Travers, explain to me, you have Rex Tillerson saying one thing, you have Nikki Haley saying something else, and you have the White House saying Mm -hmm. something else. What's going on? So that's, of course, who's right or who is projecting the administration's uh, position on all of this, because you have Rex Tillerson saying that there's been no change in the military or political posture towards Syria, that there should be a stability, a political process, but it should be the people in uh, Syria deciding the fate of Bashar al-Assad. Well, Nikki Haley, uh, almost within minutes, was saying something slightly different, that there you know, that Bashar al-Assad is not the person who should be in charge, uh, the leader there to protect the Syrian people. But if you talk to the National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, he says, well, they're both right, that both of them are saying what's the reality, but the U.S. might not be the agent of change, political change in Syria, but that doesn't mean we don't support it happening. Uh, what is this uh, news story that Russia and Iran are are uh, pushing back on America's airstrikes Mm -hmm. to Syria, saying that somehow we've crossed the line. Yeah, this was a pretty strong statement, uh, warning the U.S. against more military action, putting out this joint, you know, position on this, and it's saying that they're going to support the Syrian people, uh, that there was lines were crossed. And last week, the Russian foreign ministry called this a clear act of aggression and even suggested that things were in the works, that there was a plan in place even before the chemical strike, uh, the chemical attack in Syria last week, which the White House was saying is what prompted the president to be so moved by this and what made him take action. The White House flat out denied that, pushed back very strongly when we asked about that, saying, you know, this was a reaction to the chemical strike. Uh, The president wanted to see options after he was so clearly moved by it. And you also have Rex Tillerson over the weekend saying that, you know, this airstrike was essentially a one off in response to that attack. Now, the question, of course, is what if there's another one? What is the Trump administration going to do? Karen Travers, we heard, we're we hearing or reports um, that the airfield that was bombed was up and running in a few hours. Certainly some images, I believe, put out by the Syrian government saying that, yes, they were able to get it back up and running. The White House was saying that it wasn't necessarily the goal to strike at the runways because they can be rebuilt, but also they're also really hard to destroy in the first place, but that it was stockpiles uh, and the aircraft machinery that were taken out. Also, Karen Travers, it seems like the people who've been most critical of Donald Trump up until now praised him for this, and the people who were most with Donald Trump are against him on this bombing. Isn't politics a really funny thing? <laughs> it's, it's remarkable when you saw some of the far right blasting the president for this. And, you know, folks who voted for him with that message that he was putting out on the campaign trail of essentially isolationism, nationalism, America first. If you go back, I mean, you could almost find a tweet from President Trump on everything. But if you go back a bunch of years, the president was very clear as a private citizen and as a candidate that he didn't think anything good could come out of action in Syria. There was no reason for the U.S. to get involved. Let that be the Syrian and the Middle East problem. Now, clearly, he's changed his mind on that. And some people say that that was not a very welcome change of position by President Trump. If we follow the bouncing ball, is it... um... Bannon's dismissal from the NSA and this sort of Mm -hmm. uh, forward thinking or sort of interventionalist policy, is that a direct correlation? So 
I would say don't read into that, but, you know, it depends on who you ask. You you also have Steve Bannon losing that National Security Council meeting privilege last week. The National Security Advisor, General McMaster, says it's not a big deal. He's going to give the president advice. He always does. He will still continue to do that. But, you know, we were told by many officials close to this that he threatened to quit after he lost that position in the Principals Committee, as it's called. Bannon himself says that is absurd. He did not threaten to quit. But then you also have the whole tension with the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who is a senior advisor in the West Wing. And there's kind of a lot of infighting. And last week, the president said, work this out. I don't think it's the infighting itself that is frustrating the president, but the fact that we all know so much about it and it's in the headlines. That's a problem. I get I get a headache asking you the questions. I can only imagine you trying to keep this all straight in your own head. It's a flow chart and lots of arrows pointing at who's up and who's down on a given basis. Karen Travers, ABC News White House correspondent. Thanks for checking in. Thank you. Have a great day. 655, Big 550, KTRS. Remember, um, I, I anyone who thinks they know what the right answer is is clearly doesn't hasn't has hasn't scratched the surface of this problem. But if you take out Assad, he is help in in some ways he is helping fight ISIS. So he's he's gassing his own people, and yet beneficial to us because he is fighting against ISIS in some way, shape, or form. So. We don't want to be on the side of a guy who's gassing his own people, but we are happy that he's fighting against ISIS, right? Iran is fighting against ISIS, but also propping up a man who um, gasses his own people. So we're for Iran and against Iran, and there is no easy answer to any of this. Um, but it is, uh, it is uh, well, again, there is no easy answer. 